everyone and welcome to our fourth lecture in the deep learning for computer vision course uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, practical learning so uh, what Asaf talked about in his uh, last few lectures and what you heard about in the tutorials was how to construct a neural network a model it, uh, like an hypothesis functions and then use stochastic gradient descent to find the optimal parameters for a specific training set that you are given. But uh, as Asaf uh, alluded at his last slide, it's not that simple. There are a lot of tricks and uh, a lot of uh, minute details behind the scenes, uh, and they are quite crucial for the successful of this process. In this lecture, uh, we're going to delve into these some of these details and giving you a more complete picture of the entire process of this uh, uh, optimization and uh, deep learning process. So we're going to talk about the stochastic gradient descent uh, and uh, see that it's not very simple as Asaf uh, put it. There are a lot of details there and we'll talk about them. And later on, we'll talk about regularization of the process and talk about what is regularization and what ways we have to apply regularization to this process. We'll touch upon uh, batch normalization and transfer learning uh, if time permits. So let's recall what is stochastic gradient descent. We have a loss function. That is a function of our hypothesis function uh, set, the parameters, and the training examples, uh, x, y, and i, i. Um, and we want to approximate it by computing the loss not on all the entire training set, but only on a subset, on a batch. And this is an approximation of the full loss function, which is over the entire training set. And what we've seen is that we can update the parameters that we currently have at time t by taking a step in the direction of the gradient. So we are making the loss function smaller by taking a step where the gradient is uh, uh, pointing downwards. So what happened if we were taking uh, large steps. So this is our step size and we want to converge past because uh, money is money, time is money. And we, want, we don't want to spend our entire life uh, optimizing networks. So we are going to make uh, st uh, large steps because we want to converge past. So if for instance, this is our loss uh, function is the parameter of the uh, theta. And we are starting at this point. And if we are making large steps, this is what is going to happen. So at the beginning, we see we are trajectorying in the right direction. We are going downwards. But as we approach the local minima where we want to be, note that suddenly the process diverges. We are bouncing from side to side instead of converging to the right optimal point because we are making very large steps. So if it, taking big steps is not a good uh, idea, so let's make a very small steps, be very cautious about where we walk. And this is what happens. We are making a lot of steps and we are getting nowhere. Recall that each step entails a forward pass of a batch through the network, computing the gradients and back propagating the gradients through the network to the entire parameters of the net. So this is quite a heavy computation for each and every one of the steps. And we want to avoid them as much as possible. So for this specific settings, we can play with the learning rate and find some ideal learning rate that will eventually be fast enough to move from the starting point and it will not diverge when we reach the optimal point. But uh, this is a lucky guess. Uh, we can't hope to make this kind of guesses uh, every time we train neural networks. 
And we can't really hope to visualize this because this is a two-dimensional space. And usually when we talk about neural networks, we have millions of dimensions. Uh, we can't even uh, think of how to visualize this uh, huge space. So can we do better? So we can think about it. What we just talked about this uh, stochastic gradient descent is like a hiker that is climbing down the mountain. It only feels the slope under its feet and it makes a step as big as his feet allows him in that direction. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't remember where it comes from, what directions it already walked and just makes steps down the hill, which is nice. But as we saw, it's not good enough. Can we do better? So what we can do is we can introduce momentum. So if this was the gradient term we saw in the uh, vanilla, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Now we can introduce momentum that basically remembers the previous directions that we walked during the optimization. And if we remember where we came from, what the velocities we already traveled at, we see that it helps uh, the process converge when it reached the optimal point. So if the uh, regular gradient descent was like a hiker. Now we are talking about rolling a ball down the hill. So the ball remembers its velocity and remembers its trajectory. And when it reaches uh, the minimum, it just rolls down until it converges. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, to fail. Uh, when we update our parameters, why do we need the second term with eta times gradient of L if we already have this exact term in VT? What so will happen? No, no, uh, on the first line. Yes. Uh, after the mu uh, VT, we have a minus eta uh, times the gradient. Why do we need to have this term if we already have this term? Like, in the V. So, so this term so, yeah. remembers the previous updates and it updates yeah. in the next one. So you take the gradient to the next step. So this is the current uh, moment and it, walk, it uh, carries to the next step. But at this point, uh, you need, uh, you take oh, it okay. like the gradient descent. Okay, so and mu here is like uh, from zero it's, to one, like. Yes, so this eta is the step side of the gradient descent and mu is a, a moment, it's a parameter that it tells you how much you trust your memory and how much you want to make updates on the, based on the fresh gradients you are computing. Thank you. So, um, Adding momentum is quite nice and it really uh, improves the stability of the process. It makes you less dependent on the step size. You can now make uh, bigger steps and uh, trust you won't uh, diverge when you reach a, a, an optimal point. But the question is, can we do uh, better? Can we, do, uh, can we increase the step size and still uh, be uh, able to converge faster? And indeed, there are a lot of work on how to uh, improve upon the stochastic gradient descent. One of the uh, uh, leading directions is the Adam optimizer. And don't be panic, we'll go through this step by step. So what we have here, so this is the first moment that we saw before. So we are having a moving average of the uh, step sizes we are making. So basically we remember where we come from, what is the average uh, gradient we saw so far. The new term here in this Adam optimizer is we are taking an, a moving average of the uh, squared of the gradient of the magnitude of the gradients. And this is like a second moment or a variance of the gradient. 
And since these are moving average, they are a bit biased uh, estimators. So we have these uh, terms, uh, these denominators that unbiased these estimations. And since beta uh, one and beta two are smaller than one, and we take them to the power of t, uh, this denominator quickly becomes one and it's negligible. So once we accumulated enough batches, we have enough confidence in the moving average we have. And now when we want to update the parameters, we are using both this first and the second moment in this way. So we are uh, weighting the update by the variance of the moment. So if we have parameters that are constantly being updated, that their uh, variance is high, we'll uh, lower the update rate for them. And if we have parameters that we have, haven't updated it in a very long time, and suddenly we see a gradient in their direction, we'll give more weight to that update. So basically we are tuning the step size according to the variance of each and every one of the parameters. So we are actually trying to tune the learning rate, not as a, as a global parameter for all the parameters at once, but for each and every one of the parameters, we are going to try and fit a learning rate that uh, fits the characteristics of its changes. And this should en enable us to converge faster in, an in a more robust way. Hi, but yes. MT is a scalar, right? What? MT is a scalar. No, 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 no. V so and, M, v and M are, uh, are saved for each of, and every one of the parameters. So these are in vector forms. You can think about theta as a, a vector of all the parameters, like a million dimension vector. And you have V, which is another million parameter vector, which is the, uh, the first moment, the running mean of each and every one of these, uh, the gradients of each and every one of these parameters and uh, the variance for each and every one of the parameters. So we are making, uh, so this is an element-wise division for mm -hmm. these high dimensional vectors. So basically the optimizer needs to remember not only the gradients, but also to save like the state of the uh, running mean and running variance for each and every one of the, uh, of the parameters. Okay. I'm sorry. And if you see uh, uh, when you save uh, a state of your optimization process, you don't only save the uh, parameters uh, theta of the model, but you also save the state of the optimizer. This is also very important because as you see here, some optimizers have, uh, have a memory where the parameters come from, what was their velocity, the rate of change. And this is very important to tune the next step, the step sizes for the next uh, uh, steps. I have two questions. Uh, yes. The first one is regarding uh, the parameters beta. So in the denominator where you write beta one with uh, upper index T, is it the index or is it the power? Because the power. you have- It's B to the power of T. Ah. Okay, and uh, the second question is that uh, the, in the third line where you update the parameters, now uh, in contrast to the SGT with momentum, you don't use the current uh, gradient direction. Yes, yes, it's what? getting followed in the moment. Yes, it's a it's a small modification uh, with respect to the momentum way, but uh, this is. Um, now we are not looking at the current uh, state, but we are looking at averages, at trends of the moment, at the trends of the uh, gradients, and we update by the trends. So we are acknowledging the fact that uh, the uh, gradient estimation are noisy because of it's a stochastic uh, gradient descent. And we are looking at the trend of the, uh, of the uh, trajectory. Would that, uh... we, are, we are not trying to be very accurate, 
we are trying to be uh, wise. So if the uh, the gradient descent was like a hiker that has no idea where he is, and just make independent steps, adding momentum was like a ball that has some uh, memory of the uh, velocity. Now you can think about it as a, as a race driver that has some control over the uh, over where he is and the velocity of his car. So where to accelerate, where to decelerate, and things like that. It's it's an analogy. It's not accurate, but you can think of it of it as this way. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, in, in the second line, this is element-wise uh, um, division. It, yes, it's ele uh, all. No, all the square, the square, the square is element-wise on, on the yes. gradient. Okay. Yes, yes, you don't want to square matrices of these sizes. <laughs> okay. It, it, Thank you. So, and if we go back to our example, uh, now with uh, Adam, you see that it starts with very large steps and as it goes closer to the optimal, it tunes the step size uh, and converges uh, in a more robust way. So this is a very smooth example and it's not very clear to see the uh, differences between the variants because uh, it's two dimensional and very simplistic, but when we're talking about very high dimensional spaces, uh, these uh, variants can make a very big difference. But I hope you already see that it has effect on the uh, way the trajectory is, uh, the optimization is going. So first we start with very large steps, but as we go closer, as the training progresses, uh, the Step size is tuned and the convergence is more uh, uh, robust to the point, the optimal point. Uh, so we were able to just tweak a bit the very basic stochastic gradient descent and we achieved better and robust and faster optimization algorithms. But uh, the question, and you can find a good review in this link. I think you already have the slides on the website. So you can go and you see there are more variants. It's uh, not only these uh, uh, momentum and Adam, there are other grad and others uh, that has uh, other ways to control uh, the learning rate for each and every one of the parameters. Uh, and it's uh, uh, often wise to try some of them when you are approaching a new problem, see what best fits uh, the problem at hand. And in many cases, if you see uh, many solutions to the same problem, it appears that none of them is very good on its own. So each and every one has its pros and cons and you will have to wait and see what works best for you. If one of these variants was uh, uh, significantly better uh, then the, all the others, then uh, it would have been used and the others would have been forgotten. And this is true for many other of the uh, things we'll see here in this lecture. So we are trying to do uh, the optimization to do it fast and converge to this um, as best as we can to a minimal point. But, um, Sorry, can I ask a question about the previous? Uh, uh, just you said the different. Yeah, is there is there any theory, even if not stated here, about when to use each one, or is just uh, uh, try is, everything and hope for the best? Each and every one of them is justified by the math, by estimating the gradients, the uh, variance, and uh, etc. Um, but. Uh, there's a lot of trade-off between what theory guarantees and what actually uh, works in practice. And um, the domain of deep learning, uh, I think practitioners has, uh, are now leading the trend. So people are trying things and they are working in practice and uh, theorists are coming behind them and trying to explain why it works. I think this is the current trend. 
uh, we will have uh, towards the end of the of the course we have uh, one lecture surveying uh, what what the theory uh, state of the art in deep learning is uh, it currently is by uh, Professor Had Shamir, and um, I hope he will be able to show you the uh, show you the land of what's going on in the theory uh, perspective of uh, deep learning. So what we uh, what, what we know, what we can try to prove, and what we uh, basically speculating about right now. So uh, in terms of uh, of these variants of uh, of optimization, um, so in practice we saw that using only the uh, vanilla stochastic gradient descent is very difficult because you have to be very uh, precise with the step size you're taking and precise is basically depends on uh, the problem you have on the training examples uh, on the architecture you're using so every time you're trying to change something in your settings it will have effect on the learning rate you should use so this is very tedious. By adding moment, you're making this more robust. And by using the second uh, derivative, the, the variance, it's not the second derivative, sorry. We are not doing second derivative, but the second moment uh, uh, makes you more robust. So you can, don't need to tweak the learning rate and the, uh, these hyper parameters, the step sizes, uh, each and every time you change something in your architecture or in your data. So, um, but the question is, uh, do we really want this uh, very fast and optimal convergence? So suppose this is our uh, loss function. So this is the parameter, and this is a one dimensional example. Again, we are not in one dimensional, we are in a million dimensions. And what do you think, where do you think we would like our process to converge to? So I think most of you will, uh, will say that we want to reach this point because it has lower loss value compared to this local uh, optima. And we would like to find an optimization problem that will converge to this point. And this is indeed very difficult because this is a very steep uh, minima. If we make a big step, we can easily skip above it. If we are not uh, using momentum, we can just bounce back and forth between these two uh, walls of this uh, steep valley. And therefore we are using uh, Adam, we are using moments and we are hope to get to this point. But uh, is it really uh, our goal? So if we remember, this is the training loss. This is a loss based on all the training examples we have. But when we will deploy our network, when we'll use it in the real world or on the test set, uh, the loss function is likely to be slightly different because it's going to be affected by slightly different examples. And so if this is the train loss, the test loss might be just slightly different. But this slight different has a huge impact depending on the shape of the global optimum we landed in. So if we were at this point, now the actual test loss is going to be uh, quite high because small changes in this steep uh, local minima uh, has huge uh, change uh, a lot when we change the loss function even in a tiny bit. Whereas if we reach this shallow and uh, uh, not, uh, not very optimal point, not the global optimal, but the change with respect between the train and test loss is not that uh, significant. So basically we might say we don't really want to get the very global uh, optimal if it's not very stable. So if it's not, it's a very steep one, we might not really want to find this kind of, uh, of uh, minimal point, optimal point. We might find, we might want to say, okay, we'll settle for something that is less optimal, the only locally optimal, 
but it's more stable. So if we change a bit the loss function, if we use different examples, we'll still be relatively in the vicinity of an optimal point. So recall that once we stop training and we move to the test loss, we can't, we don't have labels, we can't really update the weights anymore. This is uh, like uh, the actual risk we are taking with the uh, with the model we trained. So this might be the reason that people not uh, didn't really abandon the vanilla SGD or the momentum SGD and went all the way to Adam in a um, in a complete way, because sometimes we don't want the fancier optimizers that can help us reach these very uh, steep points. Instead, they want to find, to use a less sophisticated optimization processes, but to find optimal points that are more stable and easier to find. So if we go back to our vanilla SGD, and we saw that uh, we are willing to compromise on not finding these steep points, but still we want to find some good optimal point and we don't want to diverge. Um, so maybe we can see that we, want, we don't want to use a fixed learning rate or a fixed step size throughout the entire optimization process. So, if you look here at the beginning, the trajectory looks quite fine. So we are making the right steps in the right direction. And only when we reach closer to the, uh, to the minima, this is where the problem starts to emerge, this uh, oscillation, this uh, divergence. So we might try to, to change the learning rate, the step size, as we go along. So we can think about, we want to begin with a high learning rate big steps just to inspect the uh, landscape, to cover the ground to see where are the large uh, basins, where are the, last, the large uh, minimums. And once we are in the vicinity of these uh, basin of attraction, then we can slow down our steps, make smaller steps and try to converge better to this point. So, we can think about uh, this trajectory. You see the colors here, we start with black, which is a very large step. And after a few steps, we can switch to a smaller step size, which is the green. And finally, when we are very close to the optimal point, we switch to a very low learning rate. So basically what we can do, we can decay, we can lower the step size as we go along. So now the step size is also a function of the training time. Any questions? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. How, how do you know when you are good to change your learning rate? Oh. <laughs> uh, I think we'll touch upon it in a few slides. But yes, it's like, how do you know the learning rate to begin with? What is the step size to start with? So this is... Um, uh, it's basically trial and error, mostly. So we'll see about that uh, in a few slides. Can I ask you another question? Yes, of course. I, I, I have, I thought a little about it when we had the first uh, homework, but when you are doing your steps, when, uh, when you are personally doing uh, something, you're uh, trying to look for few opportunities. So in here, why don't you look like in the learn rate, half learn rate and the double learn rate and choose the best one of them? Why not to do multiply, multiply uh, uh, views for every step? Okay, uh, what you can do, you can do uh, at, at each and every one of the steps, you know you have the gradient, you know the direction where you want to go, and then you can do a line search. You can now parameter all the loss function based on one parameter, which is the step size, and try to figure out what is the correct step size for each and every one of the steps. But this is basically, uh, uh, it's quite a heavy computation because you need to do 
forward and backward pass to get the gradient to know the direction. And then you need to do another uh, gradient estimation in the direction of this, uh, of this uh, specific direction, like a direction, a gradient with respect to the step size. So it's double the computation for each and every one of the steps. And basically, uh, I think there are some optimizers that will allow you to do this. We didn't touch upon them here, but they are, uh, in my experience, uh, they are much heavier to compute. So they take much longer to make each and every one of the steps. And additionally, they will uh, converge very fast to a very steep uh, minima that doesn't generalize very well, as we saw before. So you converge to a point that seems like a very optimal point in terms of the training loss. But when you try uh, to validate your uh, results on the validation set or on the test set, you get a significantly worse result because this is a very uh, uh, not non-robust point that you uh, ended up with. Hey, Shai? Yes. Um, okay. I, I didn't understand how the learning rate decay method helps help with the helps with the problem of falling into a, a, a very steep uh, minima because the the Adam method also relies on adapting the the step size. So how is so, the, how does this help you? So the Adam modifies the step size for each and every one of the parameters. So you have a different step size for each and every one of the parameters. Here, we have a single step size for all the parameters. We are making the same step size in, all, in the uh, gradient direction, but we make different step sizes in different points in time. So we start the optimization process. We're making large steps. So basically, we don't know where we started. So we just bounce around until we reach some large uh, basin, a large uh, uh, point where we can converge to. And then we uh, gradually decrease the learning rate so we can be more and more uh, uh, gentle with the way we explore this local region. So you can think of it as, well, we are hiking, so we don't really know where we want to end up. So we're making just jumps around. And then once we are seeing that this is relatively interesting area, we explore it uh, more carefully. And as we are getting closer and closer to the optimal point, we are making our step size smaller. So you can think about uh, just do it twice. So making a fixed start with a fixed learning rate and then after a few steps, just decrease it and have a lower one. You can have multiple steps, like we saw in this example. You can have something that is gradually decreasing along the, uh, the entire process. And there are a lot of other methods for scheduling the learning rate. You can do this scheduling based on the validation loss. So if, the, if you see that the, the training loss or the validation loss are plateauing, there's no change, then you would like to change the learning rate, change the step size. Um, and I leave this, uh, this is all implemented in PyTorch. You can see these uh, learning rate scheduler that are implemented there. So if you want to play with it, you can go there and see what other options there are. But basically, uh, you don't have to uh, commit yourself to a single learning rate throughout the process. You can change it. There are even some uh, scheduler that increase the learning rate. Uh, so doing something that is uh, periodic. And the overall goal is that uh, there's no single step size that can that fit the entire training process or all the parameters and therefore uh, playing with this learning rate during the uh, training process helps you to converge better to uh, a more stable and a more optimal uh, point. Any questions? Uh, yes, Shai. Yeah. Um, are there any um, optimizers that also use not only the gradient, but also um, 
how much I have uh, progressed uh, with respect to the loss. For example, if the gradient is very big and my loss hasn't changed that much, then probably I'm overshooting. And I should decrease my, uh, my step size. And if my gradient is very small and I'm not uh, getting any better, then maybe I'm plateauing and I should increase my. Um, I don't recall at the moment any uh, gradient descent that actually looks at the function itself, but they are looking at the gradients. So uh, if you have, if you are plateauing, the gradients would be very, uh, very small because you are at a plateau. And if you are, have large gradients, then you, have, you are on a slope and you can make uh, a, 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 a big step size. So. so do we have any convergence guarantees about this uh, process of stochastic gradient descent? So since the loss function, which is in a very high dimensional space is not convex, there's no single basin that we want to reach it, but there are a lot of uh, these local minimas and uh, these uh, basin of attractions, then uh, basically uh, we have no guarantees about convergence. So we don't know that if the process would converge to the global optimum, we don't know if we converged we don't know if it's a global optimum. We don't even know if the process converged. So we can uh, uh, finish the, uh, the process and we might not even be in a, in a local optimum because um, and we might be in a settled point or a, a non-optimal point. Um, should this uh, despair us? Should this make us say, well, it's pointless, uh, let's do not do any deep learning at all. Uh, as Asaf already showed you that basically deep learning was around for decades. So many people were despaired by these uh, observations, but uh, in practice, this is not what's happening. So let's see why in practice, we don't need to uh, despair and throw everything away, but we can actually do something uh, in practice that actually works. So, there's, it's not a convex problem. It's not a problem where we have a single uh, basin that we want to reach its optimal. There are a lot of uh, local minimum and local maximum, but many of them are equivalent. So let's consider this very, very simple uh, neural network. It has two layers. So this is the input. This is the hidden layer. This is the output. Uh, you already know by now that these are fully connected or uh, linear layers. And this is the function this uh, neural network implements. So the output Y is the activations, uh, it's the input times the weights of this uh, first layer and an activation function, and then the weights of the second layer and the activation function. And this is the output of the layer. So even this very simplistic uh, network, a very simplistic function, it already has 15 dimensional parameter space. I don't count biases here, only the linear weights. So this is already a high dimensional space, but think about what happens if we introduce a permutation between these hidden layer neurons. So if we only change the order of the neurons, we can introduce the inverse order for these weights. And basically we have a completely identical function. So this function and this function implements exactly the same function are identical for each and every one of the axes for the inputs. It will produce exactly the same output. They are equivalent, but in terms of where in the uh, uh, space of all functions, this five, 15 dimensional space, these two points are completely uh, far away, are completely uh, different points. So we see that basically by introducing permutations and some other uh, 
um, tricks, we get equivalent points in this high dimensional uh, parameter space, space of all possible uh, functions of this architecture that are actually the same. So we don't have, maybe we don't have this nice convex uh, landscape of the loss function. What we do have is something that looks more like uh, this uh, carton bait sim, this egg, uh, egg package. So where we have a lot of these regions that are equivalent. So you can think about this region. And if we do apply some permutation to the parameters, we end up with different region, which is exactly equivalent to the first one. So maybe we have a lot of, of minimal points, but they are the same. So if we converge to this point or this one, it doesn't really matter. We can permute the weights and go from this one uh, to, to the other. And it doesn't really matter in terms of the function we implemented, which of these uh, equivalent uh, regions we explored. Another thing we can think about that if we are reaching a global, a local minimum, it means that the gradient to all the other directions needs to be uh, positive, needs to be upwards. So if we are in a two in a one dimensional space, this can be, very easily happen. But if we are in a very high dimensional space, the chances that if you go to every, each and every one of the directions around you, that you have millions of directions and none of them leads you down, all of them leads you up, the chances that you are far away, like far upper, uh, higher than the actual global minimum, chances are very low. So you might not be so many of the directions might be leading you upwards, but there are very few that leads you downwards. So you are not in a local minimum, but you are in a saddle point, like the points here. That is some directions are leading upwards, but others lead you downwards. So if you reach a point where it seems like all the directions are positives, and you are far, it's not likely that you are far a, a higher than the global optimum. And if we reach a plateau, since we are doing a stochastic gradient descent, the next batches you will sample will produce you a different estimate of the gradient with some noise. And some of these directions, some of these noisy estimates will point, will have significant signal to lead you in the right direction uh, to get you out of this uh, plateau. So maybe we don't have guarantees about how this uh, loss uh, landscape looks like and how it behaves, but since it's a very high dimensional space, it plays in our favor because there are a lot of regions that are identical, that are equivalent, and the chances that we reach uh, a local minimum that is significantly higher than the global one are very slim. So that is why we can't uh, have any guarantees, any theoretical guarantees about the convergence of this process. But in practice, if we use uh, sophisticated stochastic gradient descent with momentum, with adaptive leveling rate, or with uh, Adam optimizers, then we can in fact uh, get to uh, very useful and optimal solutions for this uh, optimization problem uh, and help us find uh, a good parameters that solves our problems and generalizes well. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you know when you said that you permute uh, W2, omega 2? Yes. So what is the meaning of this? Is like, because you are not permuting them after you converge, right? You are retraining it and... Uh... I'm, not, I'm not training anything. So suppose you have some uh, solution some point in this uh, loss space. So a point here means you have values for W1 and W2. And for this fixed point, this specific solution that you have, I now take a permutation matrix and I change uh, 
uh, the weights W1, and I apply the inverse permutation to, uh, oops, sorry, to W2. Okay. So, so the, it's basically like changing the order of these neurons, but changing the orders uh, uh, in a way that changes both the W1 and W2. So you're still keeping the same connections, but uh, in terms of if you concatenate, if you're looking at the vector of weights, it looks completely different because now the values are, are changed. So in this space of all solutions, this is a different point, but in terms of the function that it, it, it implements, it's equivalent function, the same. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we talked about uh, the ending point where we want to our pro optimization process to end. And we, start, we say, well, okay, we start from uh, some uh, point and we go we, like a hiker, like a ball, like a race car. And we hope to get to a, a, a good point. But what about this starting point? Is it really important where we start? So uh, let's think about what happens if we initialize all the weights to zero. We want to have like the same initialization. We want to know that our process always starts from the same point. And we initialize all the weights for zero to be fair to everyone. So let's look at one of the layers, one of the linear layers in the network. So this is the forward pass, like uh, W times X. And the gradients, because it's a linear functions, the gradient with respect to the inputs are the weights and the gradients with respect to the weights are simply the inputs. So if we initialize the weights to zero, then the gradient, whoops, sorry. With respect to the inputs, the gradient that we back propagate through this layer will be zero. And basically it will be the same for all the inputs to this layer. Therefore, all the solutions we get will be symmetric. All the filters will be the same. All the uh, connections, all the weights will be the same throughout the net. We won't be able to learn different filters for different uh, layers uh, or for different uh, channels in the convolution layer. So for instance, if we look at the first convolution and the filters that were learned in a deep network for the first layer, we see we have different filters for different channels. So if we have, this is a first channel that implements a seven by seven convolution, it has 64 channels. If you remember what Asaf taught, taught you last week, we see a desired uh, property of these channels is that they will be different. They have different uh, responses here, like they are looking for different uh, angles, uh, different patterns, different colors. So we want, we don't want the gradient to be symmetric, to be the same for all the parameters. We want to be, to have some tie breakers so that each and every one, a filter, each and every channel of our layer we learn something slightly different about the problem, about the inputs it gets. So if we initialize all the weights to zero or to the same value, we won't be able to break these symmetries and to have different, uh, to be able to learn different filters uh, in different channels. So this is why we don't want to initialize to a constant value or to zero. Any question about this? Excellent. So we don't want to initialize to the same, so we'll initialize at random. So let's start uh, with initializing with a very small noise. What can possibly go wrong? So consider we have a multi-layer perceptron um, with uh, six hidden layers, uh, 4,000 dimensions, uh, for simplicity, we'll have no activation at this point. And we initialize the weights to be normal with very tiny noise, 0 
let's look at the histogram of the features of the responses of the, not the weights, the, the responses after each and every one of the layers. So we begin with mean zero activation and standard deviation 1.28. But as we go deeper, we see the standard deviation grows. The, uh, the responses uh, becomes uh, very, very large. Shai, the responses, yes. by responses, you mean the outputs of the layers, right? Yes, the feature maps. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, this is, these are not the weights. The weights are all uh, zero mean, 0 0.2 variants. But the responses, the uh, product of uh, the weights and the input to this layer. So as we move deeper, the, the activations, the responses are getting bigger and bigger. And as we saw before, this is very bad for us because the gradients of the linear uh, layer are proportional to the, uh, the gradients with respect to the weights are proportional to the uh, actual responses. So this means that our gradients are getting bigger and bigger as we go deeper. And what we have here is exploding gradients. So we have very, very large gradients towards the end. So even if we do a tiny step size, uh, this will throw us uh, uh, from point to point in the uh, space. And the training is very likely to diverge in this case. Shai, what is the, why it is so large, the gradient? Because uh, we multiply them by, these, the, by the weights. Uh, if you see the website, there's a notebook, a Jupyter notebook that I uh, uploaded that uh, allows you to play with this uh, uh, initialization and uh, plots this uh, histogram. So you can play it uh, uh, by yourself and have a closer look at what's going on inside this uh, process. But uh, allow me to uh, continue because we are slightly behind. So we don't want, uh, so 0 0.2 seems very large, but it uh, seems very small, but it's uh, too large. Let's make it even smaller, uh, 0 0.1. And let's see what's going on now. What we see now is that the activations are getting smaller and smaller. So we start with the standard deviation of 0.64. And as we go deeper, it goes smaller and smaller. What will happen to the gradients in this case? Very small. Yes, they will be very, very small. Yeah, so what? I, I didn't hear. OK. so. Uh, allow me to continue. The gradients will vanish. We'll have vanishing gradients. So basically, uh, we won't have any updates to the weights at the deeper layers. So we are not training our network. So we need to be very specific in the way we initialize the weights. So we can think of, let's try to compute what's going on. So if these are the linear layers we have, Let's think about the variance of the activation of the output of the layer as a, uh, as a function of the input of the variance of the input. So the variance of the output is the variance of this uh, product. And since it's a linear layer, this is uh, basically what's written uh, in the top row in a matrix form. Uh, it's written as a sum. And since uh, X and W are uh, independent uh, variables, we can uh, write the variance as a, uh, a product of these variance of the W and the Xs times the uh, number of uh, elements in this uh, summation. And since both W and X, I assume they have zero min, we can write this one, this uh, uh, equation. So basically the variance of the output is the product of the variance of the input times the variance of the weights uh, times the number of weights uh, of the dimension we have, the input dimension. 
And if we want to maintain the variance through the layers, we want the variance of y to be equivalent to variance x, we need this term to be one. Therefore, we need the variance of W to be one over D or the standard deviation of the initialization to be square root of one over dimension in, which in the case of 4,000 4, dimensions, it's uh, happened to be 0 0.015, which is miraculously between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02 that we randomly tried uh, at the beginning of this exercise. Sorry, so the D in here is like, is the dimensions of the input of the axis, right? Yes, and you okay. saw why it's important. Mm -hmm. okay, because if you have more inputs, then you have bigger uh, a sum, you have more uh, inputs that are summed to each and every one of the outputs. So this is why it's important uh, to have this uh, term here. And if we initialize the weights this way, now you can see that we maintain a standard deviation of uh, one uh, throughout the layers. So now we have a stable initialization and we have uh, the same scale uh, throughout our uh, uh, network. But um, there's a little caveat here that we said uh, there are no activation. What happens if we do have activations like a ReLU activation And now uh, the distribution will not be like that. How it is going to look like if we have a ReLU activation? Okay, yes, I see uh, your motions. Zero. Yes. So all the Zero. negative Zero. part is going to disappear because we are a ReLU activation discards all the negative and turns them into zero. So all these are going to be a peak in zero. So this is going to be here and you see that I uh, there's a peak here and I didn't plot it because uh, it messes everything up. But this is what happens. And again, the mean now is no longer zero and everything shifted uh, to the right a bit. But now again, if we use this initialization, we'll see that uh, the activation shrinks again and we have a vanishing gradients again. So uh, if this value for standard deviation, which is called Javier initialization, it's nice when you don't have a radio activation, if you have a fully linear, but if we have a radio activation, we want to have a correction for this term. And this is called Kaming activation, which basically says we need two over D, uh, D in because we only have half the the span of uh, weights. And if you use this uh, initialization, now you can see that the activations, the uh, distribution of activations is maintained through the layer. And we have, again, we have a stable uh, starting point with the same scaling of the activations as we go deeper when we take into account the ReLU activation. And as I said before, uh, there's a Jupyter notebook available uh, on our website to play with this. Uh, can I ask a, a technical question? Yes, about, uh, Is it uh, the default uh, activation scheme, scheme for PyTorch? Ah, uh, I don't remember offhand what is the default activation. I'll leave you this as an exercise to find where PyTorch uh, actually initialized the weights. But okay. um, Yes, but um, again, both the Kaming activation and the Javier activations are part of uh, PyTorch and you have implementation of them. Um, I don't remember which of, we, uh, which of them they are using by default. So, Kaming. Kaming is used by default. Okay, thank you. Kaming uniform. Okay, so this is slightly different than what we showed here. So we used K-Ming uh, normal here and K-Ming uniform means they are doing this uniform distribution and just adjust uh, the span uh, weights uh, according to a K-Ming uh, estimation. Uh, there was a question? Yeah, uh, if you have time for this. Uh, 
Can you shortly just explain exactly how the, uh, the standard deviation is connected to the um, vanishing or exploding gradients? Uh, okay. Just, uh, no. So uh, the output is a weighted sum of the inputs. So if I take a uh, weighted sum with the weights are very large, then the output would be very large as well. And if the weights are very small, the outputs would be very small as well. So this is why we need to strike a balance between how many, uh, the dimension of the inputs, how many inputs we are summing and the weight we assign for each and every one of these components. So this is the, how this, these two are related. And you can but see it here in the computation, how these uh, uh, two are related. Okay. So if you think about it, take all the Ws to be one, then Y would be, oops, would be uh, N times X, roughly speaking. And if you take W to be very, very small, then it's this very small value uh, over n times x. So the output would be very small as well. So you can uh, tune uh, the variance of the outputs based on the, on the weights. Okay. Shai, can you explain how do you I would see? Like, I would like to continue because we are a bit behind schedule. We want to have a break. So, uh, and we still have a lot of things to cover. So starting point is also very important because if we don't start uh, at the right uh, point, we like to have exploding or vanishing gradients. Um, the initialization depends on the architecture, like how many inputs we have and uh, how many layers and what activations we are using. So uh, we saw Javier and Kaming for the fully connected layers, but they can also be extended to convolution layers, which basically are linear operators on a smaller set of input variables, as Asaf showed you last week. And I leave it to you as an exercise to see how this uh, relates uh, between fully connected and convolution layers. And we also made an assumption here when we computed the variances that our inputs are normalized with zero mean. So this is also a very important thing that you don't take images like pixels in the range zero to 255. And we usually, what we do is we scale and uh, shift the pixel values to be roughly uh, 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 with mean zero and some uh, uniform variance. And you see this in uh, many applications where you uh, transform the images and eventually apply some uh, scale and shift to the pixel values that you ended up with. Okay, so this concluded the first part of uh, this lecture about stochastic gradient descent, and we'll take a five minute break now, uh, and we'll continue with other, uh, with the uh, uh, regularization and batch normalization after the break. So uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to stay, uh, and uh, we'll resume the, in five minutes. In well, Okay, so thank you all for coming back from the uh, very short break. Um, so what we saw uh, in this first part is that computing gradients and taking a step is a very nice high level description of stochastic gradient descent, but there are a lot of implementation details and they are crucial uh, to the success and failure of the optimization process. Um, there are a lot of other uh, details about uh, uh, the stochastic gradient descent, like the interplay between batch size and learning grade. So uh, this is by uh, all means, this is not a, a complete uh, survey of what to do and how to do stochastic gradient descent, but it only highlights uh, how complicated this process. And this is why uh, deep learning uh, was stalling for a, a very long time. But let's move on. And 
let's talk about uh, this optimization process, what we are trying to achieve. So we are uh, trying to solve a machine learning problem. So we are trying to find a function that is uh, performed very good on the examples on the problem we have. So there is a space of all possible functions of all possible hypotheses. And somewhere in this space, there's the ideal function that perfectly solves our problem. So it might be a human brain, uh, a human uh, annotator that implements this uh, ideal predictor. It might be a group of uh, uh, experts, but um, we usually don't have access to this, uh, uh, to this hypothesis, uh, to this function. Uh, we can think about all the deep neural networks in the world, which is all the architectures that we can conceive with all the parameters, all the, uh, um, all the connections. Uh, but this is, uh, again, this is uh, a huge space and, and we can't really uh, work with it because we can't really uh, talk about all the deep networks in the world. But we can commit ourselves to a specific architecture. So for instance, to the AlexNet that uh, Asaf showed or other architecture that you will see later this week in the tutorial. And already if we commit to a single uh, architecture, this space is still uh, huge because each architecture uh, has millions of parameters. So this is a million dimensional uh, space and each and every one of these parameter values represent as a, a possible function, a possible hypothesis, hypothesis, sorry. And basically when we do stochastic gradient descent, when we do optimization, we are basically uh, traveling in this space and exploring the space of all, space, all possible uh, instances of this specific architecture that are trying to solve our problem at hand. So this is a very large, uh, hyper uh, uh, space, but since we parameterize it by the uh, parameters of the deep neural network, we can actually work with it and optimize over all these solutions. So each and every one point in this space correspond to a specific value, a specific instantiation of the weights of the trainable parameters. And if we change the parameters, we are actually making moves in this space. So let's th think about a few interesting points in this uh, space, which are basically instances of the neural network we are trying to uh, train. So there's some point, we don't really know where, that performs the best from all other uh, specific instances of this architecture on the problem we have. So this might be uh, the instance that solves best the ImageNet classification problem or some other detection or segmentation problem. But um, this is the point we would like uh, to recover. Sorry. But since we don't have access to all the examples in the world, we can't really find this point. And even if we uh, by accident uh, reach this point, we don't really know that we actually got it because we don't have access to all the images and all the possible uh, true labels. What we do have access is the training images. So the training set. And what we can find, we can find some point that performs best on our training uh, examples. This is going to be the global optimum of the training loss. But again, as we saw before, uh, finding the global optimum is not uh, very easy. And what we end up is finding some suboptimal uh, solution. And this is basically where we ended the point that we have. Sorry when we finish our optimization process. So this is the, pro the point, some local optimum of the training loss. And this error between what we would have liked to get and the ideal solution is an approxim approximation error. It's error that stems because we don't really allow our 
network to implement all the functions in the world. There are things, there are functions that even a complicated neural network cannot implement. And this is why we have this deviation from the ideal predictor that uh, we don't have access to. And since we don't have access to all the images in the world, we have some estimation or generalization error. So we might perform very well on the training set, but if we have, we are seeing new examples, we are not generalizing well. So this is the type of error that stems because we are not converged to this point, but rather to some uh, point that is only affected by the training set. And finally, since we didn't reach the global optimum, just a local optimum, we have an optimization error, which is the gap between what we could have achieved and what we actually achieved in practice. And what we would like to do is make these errors as small as possible. So how can we uh, uh, make the approximation error smaller? So if we change architecture, architecture, we make our space of all architectures, we make it bigger. We allowed for more complex uh, functions to be implemented. We add another layer, we add additional filters, uh, we add more sophisticated activation functions and things like that. We can make this space bigger and therefore we can assume this point would move closer to the ideal prediction. Regarding the optimization error, this is what we talked about in the first half of this lecture. We can tweak the optimization metaparameters. We can use different uh, solver, like moving from SGD to momentum to Adam optimizer, using uh, different learning rate schedulers and things like that, and hope this error would become smaller. And if we want to make the estimation or generalization error, what we naturally would like to do is to add more examples to the training set. So if I train with only a single uh, image, I cannot expect to generalize well. And if I see more and more diverse uh, inputs, I can expect the network to generalize well uh, and to cover better the space of all images in the world. However, adding more examples is very difficult because for each and every one of example, you need a label to assign to it. And labeling can be very tedious and sometimes expensive if you don't, if it's a very uh, expert, uh, expertise or very specific, specific, specific domain. So let's talk about this generalization error and let's see uh, how uh, can we see these errors while we train. So we don't really have access to these points in this very uh, abstract spaces. But what we do have access to is to the uh, function of the loss as the training process uh, uh, commence. So we expect our training error to decrease as we train the network. So we are making steps in the direction of the gradient. We expect the loss function to be smaller. We can also have uh, part of our examples, put them aside as a test set. We are not training on this set. The network will not compute gradients with respect to these examples. We can save them aside and we can check uh, every once in a while to see how we are doing on these held out examples that should represent our uh, uh, test time or our uh, global distribution of uh, examples. This should represent uh, the golden point about the, uh, what are, how, how are we doing about the world in general. So what we see here that at the beginning as the training loss decreases, also the validation, the test loss also decreases because we are improving our network. Uh, we are doing better uh, the task and we're doing it better both on the training set 
and the validation set. But at some point, we are overfitting. So at some point, we continue to improve on the training loss, but the validation loss becomes worse. It doesn't plateau, it becomes worse. What does it mean that we overfitting? It means that instead of providing some general solution to the problem, we are trying to memorize the actual training examples we have. So the net has millions of parameters. It basically can do some sophisticated, in some sophisticated way, store the actual training examples in its weights. And instead of providing a general solution to the problem, to the classification problem or whatever, it basically memorize what it saw. And when it, it suddenly sees something that was not part of the training set, it doesn't perform well at all on these unseen examples. So this is why, so up to this point, the network does learn something useful and general, but at certain point, it starts memorizing the inputs. And once it starts memorizing, it does worse and worse on unseen examples. And this is the estimation error, generalization error, the gap between uh, this ideal uh, uh, performance on all the uh, images in the world and on the training set that we saw before. And we are going to look at these uh, graphs of the loss uh, uh, in the next few slides. And these are just illustrations in practice uh, these graphs are not very smooth and nice, as we can see here. Um, why is that? Okay, so basically we are doing stochastic gradients. So even if we do small steps in a gradient direction and everything is continuous and everything is smooth, but since the gradient itself that we are estimating, it's a noisy estimate, and each estimate is not on the entire set, but only on the batch, then these estimations are noisy. And this is why we are seeing this uh, noisy graph. And we don't really care about this, uh, uh, these small fluctuations. What we really care about is the trend. So when you look at these graphs, uh, it's important to smooth them or look at the trends and not in this uh, very particular uh, peaks and valleys that it has. So this is just a side note. So what, will, what can we do against this overfitting? How can we prevent our network from memorizing uh, the uh, training examples? So a general solution for this uh, overfitting problem is called regularization, which basically it's like an Occam razor. Like we are nudging the model toward a more simple solution. So we assume that if we have a simple solution, then uh, it, general, it will generalize, it will capture more the essence of the problem rather than memorizing specific examples. So memorizing is not a simple solution, but something that is more general should be uh, more simple to represent and should do well on both the examples, the training examples and the validation, the test example. So how do we uh, make our solution uh, simple? One way of doing that is to add to the loss function, like the cross entropy loss function, to add some term that doesn't include the training uh, example, the X, but only the weight. So we want our weight vector to be uh, small uh, in some norm, for example. So if this norm is an L2 norm, you can think about this like uh, Lagrange multipliers that try to uh, shrink the weights to reside inside uh, a unit, uh, a sphere. So we don't want the weights to go crazy. We want them to scale nicely and be uh, in a sphere. And if this uh, norm would be L1 norm, this will encourage the weights to be sparse. So we want to have a neural network that has, uh, uh, that can solve the problem using only few filters, only few uh, active uh, connections between the neurons. So uh, 
actually prunes redundant or duplicate uh, connections. And in a sense, when you have uh, the weights are not scaled, uh, are, are nicely scaled or they are sparse, this is a simpler solution and this should be uh, desired and prevent from overfitting. So another thing is that we said is that overfitting is memorizing the data. And if we don't want to memorize the data, we should have more training data. But adding more labels or more training data is, uh, is very laborious. But what we can do, we can do data augmentation. We can inflate the training set that we already have. So for instance, if we have one labeled image of a dog, we can simply flip it, apply a very simple transformation, um, but it's a different image. If you look at the pixel values, they are different. Uh, if you look at the corresponding pixel here, for example, and here, this is white, this is black. They are completely different, but still, this is a dog. And we are not restricted just to flipping. We can do small rotations. We can add some noise. We can do all sorts of things to this input image. And still, this is a dog image. So we don't need to manually label new images. We can use the images we already have, but still generate many more training examples. And the network should know that all these variations should still be classified as a dog. So it's become very, very difficult for the uh, network to memorize all these different variations. And it needs to learn something more general about the concept of what is a dog. And augmentation is a very basic uh, concept when you train neural networks. So uh, as you can uh, expect, most of them are already implemented for you. And the very basic ones like uh, flipping, rotating, and some jittering of the colors are already part of uh, torch vision and in, they are encapsulated in the model that is called transform. But if you want to go crazy, there are also uh, packages like albuminations that has uh, a wide variety of augmentations that you can apply. When we augment the images, do we make our network invariant to these kind of uh, transformations? So for instance, think that we only use uh, this uh, flipping augmentation. Do we make our network invariant to a horizontal flip? What do you think? Uh, okay. Um, so when we flip the image, we say to the network, well, this is a dog and this is also a dog, but we don't say at any point that these are the same dog. So what the network might say is that this is both a very high probability dog, but this might be uh, some probability cat and some probability, I don't know what else. And this has different probabilities for the other lower class. Since we are not imposing them to be exactly the same prediction, but only care about uh, the class label, we are not making the network invariant for this flip, but we make it uh, generalized through these augmentations. Okay, this is a very uh, minor difference, uh, but it's worthwhile uh, uh, known. So augmentations basically introduce more variability to the inputs of the layers. But what we can do, we can do uh, modifications and we can do no, add, introduce noise, not only to the inputs, but to intermediate uh, hidden layers of the network. So if this is uh, an example neural network we have, a very simple one, what we can do, we can drop some of the uh, neurons at random during training. So for instance, we can switch off these two uh, neurons in one 
uh, batch of the network. In a different batch, we can switch off these two and so on and so forth. So what we are training the network, basically we're training it on different uh, subtrees or sub paths from the inputs to the outputs and at random it in each and every one of them. So we are making the network more robust to, uh, to uh, the inputs it has. So it needs to be able to, um, to predict well based on partial observations. So it needs to be more, have more redundance and uh, more robust to the inputs. And you can think about it when we switch different paths, we are basically training sub networks and we can think about the uh, overall network that we are training as an ensemble of these uh, random sub networks. And if we have ensembles, they are usually more robust and more uh, stable than a single uh, classifier. Any questions? So deep networks has very large capacity. They have lots of parameters and they can actually use these parameters uh, to learn almost anything, including memorizing the training set. So if you want to avoid this memorization and to generalize to unseen examples, we need some sort of regularization to control and encourage the model to not to memorize the data and just to learn something that is more widely applicable. And we can see uh, this uh, overfitting in this, uh, in this graph. Another thing we can do is we can introduce an early stopping. So we can decide that once we see this divergence of the loss between the training and the validation loss, we can retroactively, uh, in retrospect, decide that we want to stop the training at this point. And if we save the weights ev after every epoch or whenever we, uh, we, we validate the net, we can go back to the weights here and say, well, these are the weights we want to use uh, for the network. And we discard all the steps here. Just, we, we just uh, keep the minimum, right? The minimum of the validation. But if you're doing this, you need to be careful because you then you need to have three sets. You need to have a training set, of example, disjoint sets. You need to have a validation set where you compute this uh, curve and you report performance on a test set, which is not the set that you uh, based this decision of early stopping upon. So uh, we saw what uh, one problem of the training, uh, training process, which is overfitting. Uh, and while we're at it, let's see uh, what else can go wrong. So suppose you start training your network and everything looks very nice. Both training and test loss are decreasing, but at some point, uh, they are both uh, going up. Um, what happened here? You increased the learning rate. Matan, yes? Yeah. One terrible step by the, the optimizer. Okay, so what happened here is the gradients exploded. So we were uh, going very well in the in the loss space and we suddenly hit a very steep slope. The gradients became very large and we didn't scale the, learning, the step size accordingly at time. And we made a very large step. So we diverged and we hit, uh, we start oscillating or something like that. Gradients became very large and it, uh, it's a feedback. So if we made one large step, we jumped to another region where we have big gradients and quickly, very quickly, uh, the gradient explode. So what we can do in this, uh, it's, it's indication of a uh, high learning rate. What we can do is we can introduce a, a learning rate scheduler that around this point should 
decrease the learning rate. And when we usually when we play with the learning rate, we just don't we don't just uh, half it. We just uh, decrease it by a learning by an order of magnitude. So in each steps, we significantly decrease the learning rate. Uh, what happened here? Learning rate maybe is too low. Yes, the learning rate is too low and the gradients are very small. So we have vanishing gradients. The gradients are very small and we have very small learning grades. So we are making very small step size. So it was nice at the beginning, we have the increase of the training and the test loss, but they are plateauing. So how do we know it's a vanishing gradient and not that we converged to a, an optimal point? What is the difference? The fact that we yeah. see a very large gap between the validation and the, the test and the training loss indicates that we are we have very large gap between uh, this uh, theta world and theta training. These two points that we saw in this uh, high dimensional space. And we uh, expect this uh, uh, gap to be very small. So if we have a good model, we should be able to do well both on the training set and the test set because they are basically uh, the same distribution, the same from the same problem. And if we see this very large gap, this usually means that we, uh, uh, that we aren't converged to a good point yet. So what we usually do is start over with a much larger learning rate. Uh, what is going on here? So again- Isn't this, it good? Isn't so this, it good? This is not bad, but the fact is that uh, we stopped the training here, but the trend is still going down. And there's still uh, a little gap between the train and testo. So this basically means that we stopped too soon. We need to continue. Maybe the slope is uh, too weak. We can maybe start increasing the learning rate a bit, but um, this is a nice trend, but it ended too soon. We want to see this plateau. Maybe you want to see the beginning of an overfitting with the uh, test loss. So um, to recap this part of the lecture, um, we talked about this uh, very uh, abstract space of the hypothesis space where we have this uh, ideal point, which is uh, beyond our reach usually. But if we restrict ourselves to a specific architecture, we can still hope to get as close as possible to this uh, point that performs best on all the images in the world. And we want to minimize the generalization error and the optimization error. So, um, so let's move on to uh, for a few more tricks. And as Michael said in the uh, uh, in the during the break, we have this uh, batch norm layers, and let's talk about what these layers are doing and why are they so important and uh, so widely used. Um, let's think about this uh, three layers network, and let's. Uh, talk about the distribution of the activations that we saw before. So we saw that uh, we try to initialize the weights in a way that all these distributions would be the same, roughly around uh, mean zero and uh, unit variance or the same variance across all the layers. But as we train the networks, the weights might deviate uh, might pull to different directions. And at some point, uh, we might have different distributions in different layers, in, in the activations of different layers. And now uh, we, uh, we compute the activation of each layer based on the distribution of the input activations. And now we compute the gradient of the loss and we make an update to the weights. So this was a forward pass, and now we have a backward pass. 
And we change the weights in such a way that we want the outputs to be uh, like these. So these are the targets. These, this is what we want them to be. So we change the weights of this layer. So based such that based on these inputs, this is what the layers saw, the optimization saw in this forward pass, it will change them to be like the desired one. But we don't only change the weights of the topmost layer, we also change the weights of the in intermediate layers. So now this changes the distribution of these layers that are different than what we saw during the forward pass. And if we use the updated weights on the, uh, what is the actual distribution now that we change the weights in the lower layers, we're going to do uh, over a correction of the outputs. So this is basically, we are uh, shifting the ground uh, underneath our feet. So maybe we did a nice change to this layer, to the parameters of this layer, but since we changed deeper layers, then the inputs for which we computed this change are no longer valid, are also changed. So we are changing things too much. So this is called the covariate shift, which basically means we are changing the inputs that we expected to see for the weights and we update the weights based on inputs that are no longer there, or a distribution of inputs that is no longer there. And this uh, really uh, makes it uh, difficult for all the network to converge at once. So if we have, uh, we are making changes here and we are also making changes in deeper layers, this makes these changes um, not so relevant. So what we can do, uh, so what will usually happen if we have this problem is that we will have to wait for the deeper layers to converge and only then we will be able to make significant and uh, uh, important and uh, significant changes and valid changes to the uh, layers closer to the outputs. And this is basically mean that we are not training all the network at once, but we, we are training from deeper to shallower layers. And this is very inefficient. So what we can do is we can add batch normalization. And batch normalization is a layer that we add after each and every one of the linear layers and before the activations. And what this layer does, it basically stores a running mean and running variance of the activations and scales the activations based on these running mean and variance. So it actually tries to maintain outputs, the output distribution to be a, a unit uh, zero mean and unit variance throughout the layer. So if we had this uh, shift of the distribution uh, caused by the weights, the batch normalization will correct it in the forward pass to be roughly uh, around zero. And once we have this uh, nice activations, a nice distribution of activations, we can trust on the uh, next layers, we know what is the out inputs it gets. So we don't need to worry about this covariate shift. And this is all done in a forward pass. So we, uh, we do the activation by the weights, we correct it by the batch normalization, and then we have, we know what the distribution of the weights is going to be. And now if we do back propagation, whoops, we change the weights with respect to this distribution that the batch normalization will maintain for us. Any questions about batch normalization? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, Itai. Um, I understand the need to give the uh, a single layer the same input as a the same distribution as an input, but uh, uh, the fact that you give it 
the same mean and variance doesn't mean that the distribution can change dramatically from iteration to iteration. So, uh, in fact, what we have in batch normalization, we have uh, two parts. We have a part that stores the running mean and running variance and try to uh, maintain zero mean unit variance uh, output. But you also learn uh, scale and variance uh, parameters that actually allows the distribution to shift. But in, uh, in a controlled way. So basically, it's not uh, bouncing back and forth based on the updates of the weights, but it has some uh, slow pace uh, trend change that the deeper layer can follow it. So in fact, in recent papers, uh, they showed that batch normalization is not exactly uh, dealing with this covariate shift, but it's more related, uh, as Michael said in the, during the break, to the scaling of the responses. So we saw earlier that having uh, roughly having control over the scale of the activations is very important to have uh, um, gradients roughly on the same side. It's a uh, size, it's important for the stochastic gradient descent process to have uh, all the gradients behaving roughly the same. So what the batch norm actually does is uh, keeping track of these scales for us during the optimization problem. So um, we don't really need to worry that much about how the exactly the variance that we initialize the weights, uh, adding batch normalization, making the whole process more robust because everything is scaled uh, in a uniform manner. And uh, as we saw before, the scaling is, is an issue. So we saw it with the uh, Adam optimizer that basically tried to find the right scale for each and every one of the parameters based on the variance of the gradient. We saw it uh, by the variance of the initialization that was very important. And now we see it again with the batch normaliza normalization that basically tries to uh, uh, track and, um, and keep the scale of each and every one of the parameters uh, from going crazy as the uh, optimization process uh, continues. Shai? Yes. Hey, what's the back propagation for the batch norm layer? Ah, excellent question. I don't have it here. So batch normalization, has, as I said, has two parts. It has a part of running mean and running variance, and it has a, a, a part of a scale and, uh, and shift that it learns. So the scale and shift are parameters that are learned using back propagation. So uh, the function that batch normalization actually performs is, uh, is a very simple one. It subtracts the, the shift and divide by the scale. So it's easy to, uh, to compute the gradient. But the running mean and the running variance are not updated through the stochastic gradient descent. They are, they are not updated by the gradients. They are running mean and running uh, variance. So basically, during the forward pass, the batch norm keeps tracks of the mean and variance and updates uh, these parameters using uh, um, running uh, mean uh, uh, running averages. So it just keeps track of these variables, but it doesn't do anything with them. It updates them as it goes along. So if you saw, uh, uh, if you see that there's a, a, a shift, it, it tracks on it. If there's a trend. Okay, but it's not part of the activation. It's part of the of the function that batch norm implements, and is updated not by the gradients, but during the forward pass. And this is why uh, during training, the batch norm has uh, one type of behavior that it tracks the running mean and running variance. But during inference time, when you deploy the network, you fix uh, the batch norm to the values it saw uh, during the training. You don't uh, change it according to the uh, uh, test time examples. Okay, uh, we need to move on. 
and I think we are running out of time. So um, I won't be able to cover transfer learning, but basically um, uh, what transfer learning is, is a way of initializing the weights, not with random weights, but from weights trained uh, on different tasks. So if you already trained a network on ImageNet, and now you want to train it for a different task, you can uh, use the weights you already know and uh, initialize from there. So the, you know they are scaled well, they perform well, and you can start from there. And uh, it's a good starting point. Uh, there are lots of uh, details there, but I won't be able to cover them, them here. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, get to this during the uh, tutorial. Um, any questions? Okay, yeah, stuff. I think we can uh, switch off the recording, and if anyone has uh, more questions.